This video deals with the Schumpeterian growth model, but now the multi-sector version. So the previous video was about the one-sector version, and here I um, describe the version of the model that leads to a smooth growth rate over time. Again, this is based on the article by Aguillon and Howe, the model of growth through creative destruction, published in the Econometrica in 1992, but it's the very simplified version that they present in their textbook of 2009, The Economics of Growth, published by MIT Press. So in the previous lecture, I had introduced the one-sector Schumpeterian growth model, and this can explain long-run economic growth in a manner where you have creative destruction, uh, growth is stochastic, and so on and so forth, and you have um, vertical innovation, but the economic growth rate would basically be on-off. So you would have positive growth in uh, one period, uh, you may have zero growth in another period, and so on, and that's not what we observe. So I will present the multi-sector version of the model now, where basically this on-off uh, growth uh, is smoothed out because you um, average over a range of different firms in the intermediate goods sector that could all be uh, innovators. And so due to the law of large numbers, you would have a certain frequency of innovation and that would be equal to the share of firms that innovate in a given uh, period. So economic growth over time will then be smooth. Apart from that, the results will stay very similar to the ones in the one sector model. So we directly jump into the model and uh, discuss the production side, where many things are similar as before. So time is discrete. The economy is populated by L individuals. Every individual is also a worker. Uh, so we don't have retirement and stuff like that. And each worker inelastically supplies one unit of labor. The individuals in this economy are again risk neutral and maximize expected consumption of the final good, but this final good uh, is now produced uh, in a slightly different manner. You have the final output, yt, it's produced with the workers, L, uh, with an output elasticity of 1 minus alpha, but now you don't have only one intermediate xt, uh, instead you have a range of intermediates. Uh, this range uh, is uh, between 0 and 1, so there's a continuum of intermediate goods producing firms, so basically infinitely many, and we integrate over this uh, range from 0 to 1 of all the XIT, intermediate goods firms, with an output elasticity of 1 minus alpha, and we have here the productivity again of um, an intermediate uh, denoted by AIT. So the difference to the previous version of the model is that we have uh, now a continuum of intermediates, so uh, many different uh, firms and not only one such intermediate sector or firm. Now, uh, from this production function, it follows that uh, output of one intermediate goods producer, or that is due to the output of one intermediate goods producer, is just this production function here without the integral, where we can then um, put together A, I, T, and L. So we again see that uh, technological progress is labor augmenting. Now, in the intermediate goods producing sector, things change in as far as we have uh, a continuum of sectors, but within each sector, there is one monopolist producing the specific um, variety X, I, T. And this intermediate goods producer again has faces an inverse demand function from the final goods production um, sector. So we take the derivative of the final goods production um, function here with respect to XIT, which is then the inverse demand function for the intermediate goods producer. So taking the derivative of YIT with respect to XIT means that the exponent comes down and it's reduced by minus one here. And we get exactly this expression where a i t l to the power of 1 minus alpha remains unchanged. So that's the inverse demand function for one intermediate good x i. The marginal cost of production is again 1. So the input in production is the final good and we assume a 1 to 1 production function. So that the firm therefore solves the profits, which is the price that they can charge from we can plug in from here, times output, that's the revenue, and the cost of production is minus the price, which is 1 times output. So we plug this in, uh, xit again multiplied by the price means that here in the exponent the minus 1 vanishes, and we have minus xit. 
if we take the derivative of this expression with respect to xit, we get the first order condition for the optimal output level of the firm. So if we take the derivative, we see alpha comes down from the exponent, multiplies with this alpha, that's alpha squared. Here at the exponent we have alpha minus 1, and here the derivative of minus xit with respect to xit is minus 1. That has to be equal to 0 for a profit maximum. And we can solve the uh, first order condition then for the level of output, which is again the same expression as we had in the one sector model. Now we can do aggregation again, these intermediate results, where we plug xit into the profit function which yields the expression here. So we have um, a i t l to the power of 1 minus alpha here, a i t l to the power of alpha here. So if you multiply them out, you have a i t l without an exponent. And uh, we have the alpha parameter to the power of 2 times alpha divided by 1 minus alpha here, and alpha to the power of 2 divided by 1 minus alpha here. So we can simplify the whole thing to 1 minus alpha times alpha to the power of 1 plus alpha divided by 1 minus alpha a i t l. So you can easily check that these are the same. Again, Aguillon and Howitt rewrite this as um, uppercase pi is equal to lowercase pi times a i t l, where the lowercase pi is this parameter cluster here, and that um, would again be related to the research incentive for a firm. Now average productivity altogether over the intermediate goods sector is the integral over all these AITs with respect to I. So uh, that's uh, the average productivity that we have in the economy. And the rest of the model follows actually as before. But average productivity replaces productivity as we had it in the economy previously. And this productivity level that we had previously um, changed over time with a certain probability. But now here we have that a fraction of firms innovate with a certain uh, probability. So um, we would have uh, a smoothed out growth rate over time because we average over the whole sector, which has infinitely many firms in it. And so uh, averaging over this sector leads to an average growth rate, a smooth growth rate over time. So then we can compute um, aggregate output in the economy by plugging the expression for xit into the production function and integrating. And here we see that um, a i t to the power of 1 minus alpha and a i t to the power of alpha, that becomes a t. L and alpha do not depend on the variety i. So if we integrate, we just get out of the a i t's the average productivity in the economy a t. So aggregate output is then this parameter cluster multiplied by the number of workers, which both are constant, and average productivity. So whenever average productivity grows, GDP would grow and also per capita GDP would grow at the same rate because the population size stays constant. And GDP is now aggregate output minus the intermediate inputs that we have of final output. So we take the integral now over all this xit with respect to i uh, for the inputs in the intermediate goods sector. And if we subtract this, <coughs> then we get an expression of GDP at time t, which is similar to the expression that we had in the one sector model. And you can easily check this again <coughs> by taking this expression here, uh, subtracting um, uh, xit, the integral over it. The integral again um, involves uh, average productivity uh, here. And so we can again simplify the two expressions, uh, the yt minus this immediate input by um, kind of having one minus alpha squared uh, here. Finally, we have to specify again uh, the innovation sector. And innovation is as before in the one sector model, where you have a certain probability of innovation for each firm in each sector. So that's phi of the research expenditures, RIT, divided by the level of technology. So it's again normalized research expenditures by the sophistication of the technology, basically. So that's the probability that an innovation occurs, which increases in research spending. That's the profit of a successful innovation. So the product would be the expected 
um, gross benefit or the revenue of an innovation. And if we subtract the cost, which is the research outlays, then we get the expected net benefit of an innovation. Maximization is now again with respect to RIT, so optimal research expenditures. So if we take the derivative now here with respect to RIT, we see that's the outer derivative here, phi prime. We have the inner derivative, 1 over AIT star, and we have the derivative of minus RIT with respect to RIT, which is minus 1, and that has to be equal to 0 for a profit maximum, so that's the necessary first order condition. And now we again plug in the um, uh, profits pi i t star uh, that we already know from the previous uh, discussion. We plug it into this um, expression. Uh, we again use this um, parameter cluster 1 minus alpha alpha to the power of 1 plus alpha divided by 1 minus alpha is equal to pi. And we use this um, notational uh, convention that Akiyama and Howitt use where they denote RIT divided by AIT star by NIT. So then if we reformulate this, we would get exactly the expression that we have here. Phi prime NIT times pi L has to be equal to 1 from the first order condition. Now we rely again, as in the one sector model, on the Cobb Douglas specification for this probability of a successful um, innovation for the firm I. And that would be the function phi of NIT. Uh, so of research spending is lambda, the productivity of uh, scientists for this firm, times NIT to the power of uh, sigma. So if we take the derivative of this function with respect to NIT, again, sigma comes down from the exponent. The exponent is reduced by minus 1. And we can now plug this result into the first order condition that we had on the previous slide and get exactly this expression that we can again solve for optimal research spending of one firm in the sector I, so of the innovator in the sector I. And that would be exactly the same expression as we had it in the one sector model. It's a positive function of um, the productivity of scientists, lambda, the incentives for R&D, pi, the uh, extent to which um, the probability of uh, successful innovation increases with research expenditures, and the scale effect in the economy. And we can then plug this into the um, function phi, so basically here, to get the probability of an innovation in sector i. So that's the crucial point here. So in sector i now, the probability of innovation would increase um, if we plug this in and solve exactly with the productivity of researchers and with the scale effect, with the incentives for R&D and so on and so forth. Now the probability of an innovation is the same across all uh, sectors because the higher productivity basically uh, in a more advanced sector would be offset exactly by the higher cost of innovation that is brought about by this um, uh, normalization here divided by the um, uh, level of uh, technologies or the sophistication of technologies. Now again the growth rate of Per capita GDP amounts to GD, which is 80 minus 80 minus 1 divided by 80 minus 1. And note here that's now the average productivity over all the sectors. And growth in a sector would be random again, where the productivity level in this sector, AIT, would be gamma times the productivity in the sector in the previous period, um, T minus 1 where gamma is greater than 1 with a probability mu, so if the research um, effort is successful. But it would stay the same as in period t minus 1 with a probability 1 minus mu, so if the research has not been successful. And by the law of large numbers, we can now then compute the average productivity in the economy basically as the average productivity of firms that were successful in innovating, denoted by A1t uh, bar, uh, multiplied by the probability of a successful innovation, which is then also the share of firms that successfully innovated, plus 1 minus mu, so the share of firms that did not successfully innovate, and the productivity in this um, for these firms would be A2t bar. So then we can plug in 
So the successful innovators have a productivity gamma a t minus one times mu, and then not success the innovators that were not successful have a productivity of a t minus one. And the share is one minus mu. So that's then the average productivity in the economy, mu times the productivity of successfully innovating firms plus one minus mu, the productivity of not successfully innovating firms. Next, we can plug in this expression for AT and for AT minus one here in this expression and would get that the growth rate of the economy, the average growth rate would then be mu times gamma minus one and we can again plug in the expression that we've derived for mu uh, previously and uh, would then get the expression that we have here that the growth rate of the economy again increases with the productivity of scientists with the scale effect with the incentives for R&D and with the step size of an innovation so that's exactly the same growth rate in the economy as we had it uh, in the one sector model but now the main advantage of this version of the model is that we do not have periods of zero growth and periods of positive growth but we have a smooth um, uh, growth rate over time so we have indeed a balanced growth path <clears throat> if you will where the growth rate of the economy stays constant thank you very much for watching the video and i hope you found it interesting and useful for more videos on economic content, uh, please visit my channel that you find here to the left. Um, and to the right, you see the next video in the series at the top. And at the bottom, you see uh, the whole lecture in the form of a playlist.